Uh, so I'm Teresa Slotik. Um, we're going to talk today about how to build routines into ESL, ELL, ESOL, whatever you call it, classrooms. Um, a little bit about what we're going to talk about today. I want to give you um, some background on our organization as to, to why we're a really good fit to provide be providing this information. Um, we'll talk about kind of just in general, when you're working with especially adults on digital skills, why it's important and some of the challenges you might encounter, in, you know, adults who are also learning English. Um, a couple of ways that you can assess people's skills. And then looking at teaching um, digital resiliency, which I'll talk about a lot more. And also why do the students care about learning this information? And then we'll really focus most of our time on kind of looking at the routines and brainstorming, hopefully, um, how you might tailor these to the populations you're working with. So, uh, and as always with me, please feel free to jump in anytime with questions or comments. You can either unmute or you can put something in the chat um, that is you know, why, why I'm here is to really answer what questions you have. So North Star, I, I work for North Star Digital Literacy and our, um, we are part of a nonprofit called Literacy Minnesota. And this nonprofit, Literacy Minnesota has been around for over 50 years. And we, we have over the course of that time really focused on adult literacy. So a lot of the background that the you know, the writers of this, this, these routines are coming with is from all that extensive experience. We're, we do have three, three of our own schools in the Twin Cities um, that do English language learning, citizenship, reading, writing, math, um, and of course, digital literacy. So we draw from that. And then we also are the statewide, I'm in Minnesota, as you might have guessed, uh, the statewide trainers for volunteers and teachers who are working with adults on literacy. And so because of that, we do have a lot of resources that are available to you. I would say 95% of them are free and um, all about, all about uh, working with either English language learning or adult literacy. And I those resources are, are accessed by people around the world. So I want to just show you where they are, since you may be working with these um, populations and they might be helpful to you. So they are on the Literacy Minnesota webpage, um, not the North Star webpage. And so literacyminnesota.org, literacymn.org is the webpage, and I can put that in the chat. Um, and then it's under educator resources. So let me just put this in the chat for y'all. So this is, in case you come to the homepage, I just wanna show you how this goes. This would be, if you just came to literacymn.org, this is what it looks like. And you see above the picture, there's these tabs. And if you go to educator resources, and then just go to the Educator Resources Library. So here you can find, again, all kinds of um, information. You can search by keyword. You can look for um, you know, audience. So if you're looking for adults, children, or staff, by topic, you can see there's a plethora of topics here. Um, the format you might be interested in. So are you looking for a tutor tip? Are you looking for videos? Are you looking for a full blown curriculum? And then the level of learner. So these would be English language learners um, if they're pre-beginning, intermediate, beginning or advanced. If you scroll down, here are some featured resources. Again, 95% of what we have here is free. And so, you know, I just encourage you to take take, um, what I want to say, make use of this resource that you have available to you. Take advantage is what I was trying to say. <laughs> um, we also do advocacy around adult literacy. And then, of course, with North Star, we do digital literacy. 
So kind of bringing these, all these pieces together into this, this um, new, these new routines that, that my, my colleagues have developed to help you integrate digital literacy into um, ELL. And kind of the background of that, you know, so I, I'm working with North Star. I get to talk to great people all the time. And many times I'll hear from teachers, uh, North Star is written at a kind of intermediate English language level, grade four. And sometimes teachers will say, well, um, either I don't have funding to do both English language learning and, and digital literacy. So how can I incorporate digital literacy into my English language learning classes? Or um, they might say, uh, North Star is written at a level that's higher than what my students can, can read. How can I still incorporate digital literacy into the lessons? So that's what prompted us to create these, these routines uh, in the classroom. So this would be you know, more useful for people you're meeting with on a regular basis, either in a class or even if it was one-on-one -on -one tutoring, you could use these resources. They are free. Uh, you don't have to have, you all do have North Star, but a person wouldn't have to have North Star to access them. Currently, they are in, they just finished um, kind of being reviewed by several organizations. We'll look at that. And they are available, but um, we have not put them publicly on the website yet. It's just, just hasn't happened yet, but I will provide you the link so you have access to them. So, um, Let's talk about, I'm asking you, how does a lack of digital skills contribute to inequity? So if I'm a person who doesn't know how to turn on a computer or use a mouse or search on the internet or use email, what are things I cannot do? Um, it may make it harder for you to, I'm sorry, we were supposed to respond, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it may make it harder for you to perhaps expand your job search, especially with, um, you know, online uh, being one of the, you know, online kind of searches and connections being one of the drivers of how people uh, get yeah. modern day. I mean, most, most, many jobs are online now and most applications are, require computer skills for sure. Yeah. What else? What else couldn't I do if I didn't have these skills? I would say apply for benefits. Right, almost all government benefits are are you apply for online. Okay, that's good. I see something in the chat. Yep, just filling out unemployment benefits. Exactly. Anything else that you can think of that I couldn't, I won't be able to do. I didn't know how to turn on a computer, didn't know how to use the internet, use email. Uh, I want to look, be able to look and apply for housing or telehealth, right? Great. Um, it would be hard for me, you know, think about how many times, or at least I, I'm always looking up information on my phone. And so I wouldn't have access as quickly to all that information. Now, some of it might not be true, but um, I still wouldn't have the access to information that other people do. Um, most schools now communicate either through email or through a parent portal. So uh, as a parent, I wouldn't be able to, to find out what's happening at my child's school or um, communicate easily with the, the teacher. How about with libraries? What couldn't I do? Search the catalog. Um, right. I mean, actually quite a few functions because we've moved a lot of functions online. Um, maybe, you know, if you wanted to do self-service for something, you couldn't, you know, check out a museum pass. Like right. quite a few things actually. Yeah, yeah, right. You, you all usually have a lot of resources online that I wouldn't be able to access. So, um, so this is why it's important to for us to everybody to teach digital skills, because you really it's hard to participate fully in in American life 
if you don't have the skills. And so, and it's often that we see um, populations that have been underserved historically often are the same ones who don't have the skills, not always, but sometimes. So we want to make sure, you know, this, this is an equitable issue and we want to make sure that we are helping close this digital divide. All right, so what do you, for any of you who have worked with people on teaching digital skills, what challenges uh, do you find? Uh, what I found interesting is um, the teaching often begins before we even get to North Star, because there is a certain amount of digital literacy that you need to even Hey, I need to navigate to the website. I need to type in the. I need to yeah. use the mouse. And not too long ago, I, I mean, I had a patron where uh, that I was helping with something, and we we actually went through the process of like he just got a laptop and never even turned it on. Like we had to even start with turning the thing on. Yep, yep. I mean, that's a great example. Um, I too, where uh, North Star is working with a. Uh, a business that has has uh, factories, you know, nationwide, and they have people from, oh, I think it's something like fifty different countries who are coming to work on the on the line, and they have to to get into the system. They actually have to create a password, and and you think you don't think of that as a digital skill. But even knowing, you know, many people don't know the English alphabet. Many people don't know what a capital letter versus a small lowercase letter is or what the, the symbols are. And so there's this even pre, way pre North Star of learning all that information so they can create a, a password. So, um, yeah, sometimes there's and, and it's hard. It's hard for us who. Have been using you know computers for a long time sometimes to remember all those little steps that that we take for granted that you know like how to turn on a computer or our digital uh at Lourdes in Minnesota we have digital navigators and um oftentimes people would call in a panic that we had given out laptops saying my laptop stopped working and they didn't realize you had to charge it and so, and of course the, you know, initially the digital navigator didn't think about telling someone that. So, um, so there's a lot of, so that, that was a great example. Any other things, you, any other challenges you've come across? We had a lot of folks who didn't know how to use a mouse. Mm -hmm. So uh, I know a lot of places have touch screens and a lot of, People have experience with phones, but like cutting and pasting and stuff like that, they they couldn't. Yeah. Right, you know, a mouse is a physical skill, and you have to, you know, if you re if you remember um, learning, it it's not just even just clicking. You have to kind of know how quickly to click click if you're doing two clicks and how to move it around, and it's a it's a spatial skill um, that that is one that isn't you're not just gonna know how to do it automatically, right? So that's a good example example too. Um, I was just thinking of something, what was it? Oh, a lot of times when working with people who have low or no digital literacy skills, there's also a lot of fear and anxiety involved. Um, fear they're gonna break the computer, they're gonna mess it up. And, and I often see um, fear that they're just not going to be able to learn the skills, like it's beyond them. And so we want to make sure um, to, to kind of, you know, ease that fear. Uh, I also see a lot of times staff and, um, you know, instructors have maybe never taught digital literacy and they're not comfortable teaching it. So that can be, that can be a challenge as well. Um, if people aren't comfortable teaching it, either they won't, or that discomfort might get transmitted to people who are trying to learn, and, and that kind of builds on that fear. All right. So let's see. Um, time is another one. If, you know, it takes time, especially, you know, as you were 
talking about the person who came in with a laptop, not knowing how to turn it on, that's going to take a person at, at the library's time working with someone. They may not have equipment, um, so it's hard to teach computer skills if you don't have a computer. Um, the language barrier might be an issue. Uh, instructor knowledge that we talked about. And then also, if you're providing classes, you you often find that you have a wide variety of skill levels on the digital side. So maybe it's a class of people who are all at the same language level, um, but their digital skills could, could vary quite a bit. So as I mentioned, we created these routines and they can be used with any curriculum that can be used standalone. Um, they do, they are aligned with North Star and uh, a, a curriculum that Literacy Minnesota has developed called English Unlocked, but you don't have to have either one of those. I mean, you have North Star, but you don't have to have either one of those to use the routines. They're appropriate for all um, levels of ESL. And they really are looking at just what you're talking about, um, those foundational digital skills, like starting out with how do I turn on my computer? We also want to be sure, because if we're working with people who are who um, are learning English, we want to include the vocabulary of digital skills too. So if you're teaching, you know, just people, if you haven't, not just, but if you're teaching English and you teach topics like clothing or transportation, well, digital skills is just another topic that you need to learn vocabulary for. And that vocabulary will ultimately then help you learn the skills. And like I said, the routines are, are free. Ultimately, we will put, be putting them in your North Star admin portal, um, in uh, just on the North Star homepage and also on the Literacy uh, Minnesota Educator Resources. And I'm hoping that happens within the next month here. So for those of you who've used North Star, you know that you know you can use the, the North Star assessments for with a language level of higher intermediate to advanced. Um, but as you say, sometimes if you, the person's digital skills are, are low, they're not really ready to take the North Star um, assessments. And um, we, do have some kind of for these these what do I say routines? We do have a rubric which is kind of like a a table, looking at here are some different skills that that's someone you could kind of ask to see if they have them. We also have in North Star um, we do have some paper and pencil um, checks if the assessment if the North Star assessments are just too much, you know, like you said they person doesn't even know how to turn on the computer. And you wanna just get a quick sense of what maybe they do know. So maybe they have a phone, maybe they know some things that they can do on the phone, even if they've never encountered a computer. I do wanna show you where those are. And again, they're paper and pencil, um, kind of quick checks, if you feel the assessments are initially too much. So if we go to uh, your North Star admin portal, which will take me just a second. Um, all right, so we're looking at this blue navigation bar. Right now I'm on the landing page where mine says demo and yours would say the name of your library. Uh, one thing I do that's new in North Star that I, for this week, that I wanted to just point out to you because um, I think it makes life easier is that we've added the curriculum link on the blue navigation bar. So if you wanna to go to the North Star curriculum, you can just click there. You don't have to go into resources. So that makes it a little quicker and easier to find. But these assessments that I was talking about, um, these paper and pencil kind of assessments, they would be located under resources, like most things in North Star. Um, in the here you see in the middle of the blue navigation bar kind of and they are under other resources this kind of hodgepodge of other things at the very bottom in the middle column so if we click on view other resources and then go to the bottom you see there's these two screeners and the first one 
kind of looks at um, what do people know? Do they know what a laptop is? Do they know what these words mean? Um, do they kind of have they are they familiar with these um, cursors? So there's some questions here. And if you're working with people who don't speak English or Spanish, we have in both, but if they don't speak English or Spanish and you have someone at the library who can tr translate, it's much easier to translate from this piece of paper than like the North Star assessments. The other screener, I kind of personally like better, but it's more interactive. And so here you're just asking someone to point to these things. So again, you're you're testing, do they know these words as well as do they know what th these things are and how to log on, how to log off. So it can give you an idea of, you know, like you're saying, are we starting from absolute beginner or do they know some, a few things? So that can help you a little bit. Um, all right. So, you know, this is what the North Star assessment, you probably are all familiar with the North Star assessment, but the North Star assessment itself does require someone to, like you said, be able to get on the computer, click on the, the link you have bookmarked. And definitely I would bookmark your, um, your site specific URL on the computers in the libraries. So they're not, because as you all, all probably know that URL is super long, you don't wanna have to type in the whole thing. Um, but they still have to be able to do that and then, you know, kind of navigate the assessment. Um, also in North Star, when they they'll get these results page, and if you're seeing someone who maybe did take the assessment and the results are really, really low, um, or they couldn't get through the assessment, again, these routines might be a, another good place to start. So kind of useful in several different situations. I do want to take a moment to talk about digital resiliency. And the digital resiliency is the idea idea that um, we could there's there's no way we could ever possibly teach someone everything about every you know software or system out there because it's, one, there's a lot, and two, it's always changing. So the skills we want to give people are skills that can be transferred across devices, across, platforms, across software, and across situations. And many times, you know, you'll if you teach someone what a menu bar is in one situation, it's going to do basically the same thing when they encounter it in another situation or on another platform. So what we found, though, is that um, people new to digital literacy or, you know, who have lower digital literacy skills don't realize this. So they may learn, let's say they learn Word, and then they say, well, I, I don't know how to do anything but Word. I don't know how to do Google Docs. What we want to teach is that um, much of what you might see in Word and the skills that you would use in Word will be transferable to Google Docs so you can figure it out. And we want to give people the understanding that they can take what they know and oftentimes figure new things out. Uh, and that takes us explicitly pointing that out. So the more uh, more you can say, um, you know, this is this is how you turn on a computer, not only this laptop, but most, almost all devices have a way to turn them on. Well, all devices have to have a way to turn them on. Oftentimes it will look like, you know, this symbol to start the power. Most devices, I would say all devices need some form of electricity, either, um, as you're working on them or to charge them. You know, so these are things that you can just kind of, as you're talking, making sure that people realize that it's not just the specific situation or for this specific application, but it's really a skill that can be transferred. Any questions about that or, or thoughts? Okay. So another, um, thing that I often encounter is that a lot of times we as as educators um, know what we want to teach and we sometimes forget about well what are the goals of the people we're teaching and so it's really good to know to think you know why would someone want to learn these skills if they've gone through their life and they haven't 
didn't know them. We talked a little bit at the beginning of why this might help them, but I think there's also a piece of explaining to, to the learners why this might benefit them to learn. Uh, I was talking to a, what was it, adult school, and they were telling me um, that they were trying to get people to sign up for the computer classes, and they were saying, you know, it will help you learn skills to find a job. And many of their students were women who were taking care of kids and who said, well, I'm not looking for a job, and so I don't want to do it. So when they then, uh, you know, we brainstormed, and when they then said, well, how do you think learning computer skills might help you or what is it that you find difficult to do? Uh, it came, what came up was talking to teachers, their kids' teachers, you know, over email or knocking those emails. So when they then presented the class as, well, this is gonna help you learn these skills, a ton of people signed up. So it's again, figuring out, you know, just like in any sales job, what, um, why do people want want the skills? And then, if you are teaching other classes, um, how do you how do you relate those skills to what's being taught in the class already? Right. Um, so, looking at how you might integrate those into the rest of a lesson. But I do think it's really important. You know, I did talk to someone once um, who we were we were sitting. He was, he was trying to get his GED. And we were, I was um, the navigator at the time. And I was, he was saying, you know, I just, I want to study, um, but my friends all want me to go out and do stuff on the weekends. So I feel like I can't study. And I said, well, you know, maybe you could set your goals for the weekend of what you want to study. And then once you're done, go hang out with your friends. And he said, I can set my own goals. I said, yeah, he's like, no one's ever told me that I could do that. And it was just uh, eye opening for him that he had this power to decide what he wanted to do. Um, so I think just remembering that we're working with adults and they have their own agendas and, you know, making sure we understand what that is. All right, so let's take a look at the routines. Um, we have, the team has finished uh, routines for basic computer skills and internet basics, and they're working on using e the using email skills. Um, we did have, we wanted to, you know, we made the routines, we wanted to make sure they were actually useful. So we did have them piloted by uh, many adult education instructors and learners in several states, and they gave us feedback and then, you know, they change them uh, per the feedback. I want you all to though, to think of this time as um, uh, something hopefully fun that we can all brainstorm and share ideas and you know use our creativity because the beauty of the routines are they are, they are PowerPoint uh, slides and you can edit them. So you can download them and edit them to fit the people that you're working with, the situation you have, you know, um, what you feel will be best for the, the learners that you're working with. And so um, they aren't set in stone. It's more of, they're more like guidelines. And so I think the more we can think about as a group, how could we incorporate these, the better off we'll all, we'll all be. So the routines that are currently created um, under basic computer skills, are how to how to get to know your device, practicing the mouse, and then keyboard keys and typing practice. And under internet basics, it's connecting to the internet, finding information online, and kind of websites. So this is what it this is what the document looks like, um, and this is what the first kind of routine looks like in terms of you can see that it's very that these are the objectives very basic. Um, we wrote, I didn't, but the team wrote this in um, hopefully easier to understand language. So you can see that it's, um, you know, very, we're going to learn to turn devices on, we're going to learn to turn them off and find the important part of our devices. So here's an example of how you might, uh, this is one of the slides. 
And you can see that, you know, this is something that you can talk to people about to help them learn the names of things and how um, uh, they look different. Um, as you think about the people that you're working with, how would might you modify this? Um, let's say someone is very new to digital literacy or or perhaps a very um, new to learning English. How might you modify this to fit that situation? Or walk through this. Let's say I'm learning this. How would you use it with me? What might be helpful to either I, have? I, I just, I just, as I was looking at this and thinking of English, I was kind of uh, like ex explaining. I'm sorry, <laughs> explaining like what a what does desktop mean? You know, I don't know. Right away, I started. I started to think of the word in Spanish for lap. Right. So that just to be able to explain, you know, what why one is desktop and one is called laptop. So that's a really great idea, and and that would even be um, something that you could perhaps, depending on the level of the class, bring to the class. Why do you think? Well, you know, what is a desk? First of all, uh, what is a lap? Why do you think one is called a desktop and one is called a laptop? Now, if you had examples of both of them, that'd be even better. Like the pictures are good, but if you had real examples, you know, you could see the lap, the desktop takes a lot more space than the laptop. Um, but I like even even just that incorporating that into a, a lesson, let's say you're teaching English, a lesson, you're teaching digital literacy because you're teaching the names of those devices. Um, and you're te teaching English too. So you're kind of building around, you know, what's a desk, what's a lab, what's the top of something, why do we choose these names? So that's a great example. Um, how about anyone else? How would you maybe approach this with the people you are working with? Um, maybe change it. Or skip it. Maybe you'd skip it. Saying, oh, people already know this. Well, I like that you could probably change the pictures so that mm -hmm. they would look more like what somebody might have. You know, mm -hmm. if you know that they, you know, you're for the smartphone, would you right. show an Apple device or would you show an Android device? Yeah, that'd be great to more personalize it to what people are using. I think too, it's nice to show that all of these things are devices. What, but why? Why are we, why do we lump them all together? I mean, they are, but that might be a good, you know, because they connect, they can connect us. They can connect us to the internet. Um, we can, we can, um, communicate with them through written words, usually tablet may not be connected to the, well, I mean, cause we probably have Wi-Fi, not phone. Yeah. So again, helping people see that phones are actually a kind of device. So, and that can help too, if people are nervous about digital literacy, most people nowadays do have smartphones. And so you can say, you actually have used a device and are used to some functions in the device that um, maybe, the, maybe the functions are, might be available on the other devices. All right. So here's the here's another slide. And this is again talking to the point of like, how do I turn this on? And this can uh, be used if people actually have a device that they're looking at, or you could project something on the screen if they didn't all have their own devices. Um, 
So what are we teaching here? Is there a way you would break this down further or, or make it more difficult? Well, one thing I'm thinking about is that symbol and how it's used for so much. Mm -hmm. So that might help. Um, yeah. And, but also in some ways might be more confusing depending on where people have seen that. And then I'm thinking about my own phone. Like, so on my laptop, the button is right there, but on my phone, I have to swipe down, swipe down again, and then find that symbol. So if I don't understand those steps, it's much harder to find. Yes. Right. That is true. And some phones don't have it anymore, right? You just touch the screen and and you turn it on. Um, so so those are all good good examples of you could show either pictures or devices, various devices that do have the power button symbol on them and say, you know, you can see it, it here it is on this lap. This is where it's located on this laptop. This is where it's on this desktop computer because it won't be in the same place in you know every situation. But to get the understanding that that symbol typically means you turn something on, and it could, don't have to be a computer. It could be, um, I don't know, thinking like of a speaker kind of has. Sometimes they have those symbols. Um, and it would all you know if someone said, "But my phone doesn't have one." It's also good to recognize that we need to turn on devices some way. Many times, if you see the power button, you know that's how to turn it on. Um, you may not see it, and that doesn't mean you can't turn it on, but it's just a different way. Uh, yeah, the your dryer, wash my washer has that symbol on it. Um, so it's something that people are going to encounter and probably have encountered in a lot of potentially places. Now we have these, uh, you know, descriptions of the power button is next to under the tab. So that might be challenging for someone who's a kind of lower English level. Um, so I might say the power button is I might pick one of these words, or I might say the power button is where to the, you know, asterisk, and then show the symbol, not the word, so that people can, that's what I'm looking at on my screen, you know, it's next to the asterisk on my screen. So you'd want to have people to know what these directional words are first, um, and maybe you're teaching them in a different context, but then you could bring this, this in to say, hey, we learned about next to, under, on top of, et cetera. So now looking at the screen, where is the power button in relation to X? And that's you gonna also... come up with, I'm sorry, that's gonna come up with right click, left click, turning it you know, on your page where you need to, on some computers it's on the left and some computers it's on the right, you know. Right, so directions are really important to, to teach, about, not just, for computers, obviously, but um, yeah, getting around of, town, <laughs> right, <laughs> right, um, and you you know you might say people might you might add on, well, what does the power? So for, you're finding it, but then you probably want to say what does the power button do? So if you have if you do have a device with a power button that you can demonstrate, okay, when we then teaching the word click, when we click it or press it, what happens? And then if I press it again, what happens? And I believe, and North Star believes that it's hard to learn digital literacy through lecture alone. So if you can, if you can incorporate, you know, the actual practice, um, people learn a lot of different ways and being able to manipulate, you know, devices, um, even if they, uh, are sharing a device or um, it's it's you at the front of the room and they're coming up and just handling it for a little bit. It can help with that learning. Um, any other thoughts about this particular slide? What I like about these slides for me is a couple of things. 
one, it makes me really think hard about all the things that I take for granted and that are not that are not known if you've never worked with computers. And two, um, just the idea that you know a lot of the terminology that we use in basic computer skills are is important terminology, important vocabulary in you know life. So in learning English, so they can go hand in hand quite a bit. All right. Now, how about, so how about looking at this slide? How might you um, use this or change it? Or you maybe use it, leave it the same. And have you ever all done this? Like you're working on several devices and then you go to your computer and you're like pre pressing the screen. <laughs> it's like, it's not doing anything. <laughs> uh, so that's that's um, something that you can, you know, mention, you know, have people try. If you touch this laptop, does anything happen? Versus if you touch this tablet. Now, again, you might not have all these devices at your disposal. Um, but if you, for some reason, are able to have them, that's a good way to show it. Um, you know, as I think about it, people might need to know, might be helpful to know what does touch mean. So you might have to demonstrate, you know, touch first, and you can touch a lot of things, right? All right. So now, um, depending on the devices you have, some touch screens do have a keyboard, like you can have a tablet with a keyboard, um, or you could have a, a mouse. So, um, I, and with a laptop, you wouldn't necessarily have to have a mouse, right? You could have a touchpad. So you might wanna change this to fit at least the devices you initially have, or even just teach the keyboard, keyboard and mouse, if you're, if you know, it's confusing as to these are ways, uh, maybe teach touch screen or, um, uh, sorry, what's the pad called? Well, pad. <laughs> and I should know that, um, keyboard and mouse, that these are ways you can move, um, you can do things on the computer. So then you can see here's a touchpad example here on this slide. And this is getting people just kind of familiar with the device that they, they might be using in the classroom. Um, but also with any device they might have, you know, at home. Someone was saying to me, like, it'd be interesting to show um, a mouse, an old fashioned mouse with the, with the plugin and then the picture of the animal and see why did people call this device a mouse? And you know, and why does it look like a mouse? And now, now they don't have the cord usually, but um, when they were developed and named, that's what they had. And I thought that would be, I thought that was a good idea. So, um, so you can see these again are really basic, basic skills. You can, um, I, I oftentimes encounter um, people who, instructors who want to, you know, they feel like I want to cover this material in this amount of time. And sometimes then that means they'll be going faster than people are learning. And, and really what I have heard from learners is they would rather learn something and learn it well in digital literacy uh, versus learning a lot and not understanding. So it's it's better to spend, you know, if you have to spend a week on what what's the difference between a mouse and a touchpad and getting people familiar with that or even longer, that's okay because they're still learning digital literacy. They're still learning the terminology. Um, if you have a mouse, they can start learning how to hold it and just get the feel for it, play around with it. Even before you teach them the, about the left and right clicking, um, just showing them how to, you know, which way you hold it, 
trying to hold mine, uh, is, is prepping them for that skill. So kind of the pre-digital literacy. Um, and if you are just working with people, you know, on maybe their, their reading ability is fine. It's still a great way to get them comfortable with, okay, hey, I can learn these things. It's not hard to see the difference between a touchpad and a mouse and um, getting the feel for touching them, kind of holding them or using your hand on them. Uh, this can, can build confidence in people to see like, oh, today I learned how to hold a mouse. You know, it's it's a, it is a skill and it's something that is not, uh, is less daunting than saying, okay, now you need to right click and left click and double click and, you know, all in one lesson, depending on the person. All right. So again, as we go through these, you can see we're really, we're really focusing on um, these basic, basic parts of the computer. Um, what are your thoughts about uh, people who, you know, Gitri, you were saying about the person who came in with the laptop, not knowing how to turn it on. I've heard, um, I've had learners tell me that they were in that situation. Um, what do you think about using some of this information with those people who maybe their literacy is fine, but their English literacy is fine? And I'm not sure maybe you had to step away to help a client. I'll come back to that. Um, so, all right, so as we look at this, you see that we're still kind of getting now into the parts of the computer. Um, and this is something, you know, again, you wouldn't have to do this in order. So let's say you're gonna do a Zoom, a class over Zoom. You're planning to do a class over Zoom. This could help people to identify where their camera is. Cause you know, we've all been on Zoom calls, um, maybe especially with like grandparents where all you see is like looking up their nose or <laughs> their one eye or something. So the idea of knowing where the camera is and what it looks like can be really, can be really helpful. Um, so what I'm saying is, you know, you can, feel free to skip around in these slides, depending on what your aims are, your goals are, and what the um, learner's goals are. All right. Now, some people, um, again, this is a lot of vocabulary that we're starting out with, which is kind of what in North Star, the basic computer um, module is, a, is mostly about. Um, but it's kind of, getting people, giving people that language so that they can understand when you're later um, explaining different skills. So here you might learn what these things are. Someone might ask, what do they do? Why, why is this important? And so you might also wanna incorporate that, right? So you might say to them, I use my USB port to turn on my ring light or whatever it might be. Any thoughts here on this screen? I'm wondering about potentially getting bogged down in detail because then there's, you know, like a micro USB or the um, like Apple devices have um, like their own like mm -hmm. the plugs and stuff so and, and some of the other things I was thinking how like for instance a desktop doesn't have a camera built in but you might have a peripheral so then yeah. you know I, I think it's you know I wonder about the balance of providing enough information but then also not overwhelming Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's a really good point. And especially for maybe people who are starting out with digital literacy, it, I would probably go with whatever device they have and then teach what is on that device. So if like in the, in the case of the person who brought in this laptop, I think you said that they had never used looking at what, what are 
the, you know, all the various holes and, and um, cameras or not that are on that device. So um, they know what they are, but then also um, making sure they understand that those are often can be found on other devices uh, too. Uh, sometimes not, but sometimes you can find them on other devices. Other thoughts? What do you... What are the rest of you think? Would you, now for the North Star assessment, right? You have to know what a USB port is, for example. But um, initially it's probably better just to get people feeling comfortable with the device and being able to use it. And then going maybe back to this and say, you know, if your device doesn't have a USB port, some do. This is what it looks like and what it's for. I don't know if this is a good spot to kind of um, ask this or, you know, bring this up for discussion. But I keep rolling around in my head what you just said about learners would prefer to learn content well rather than mm -hmm. cover a certain amount of content in that time. And I feel like when I was teaching classes, that is so anti what my, like I would think I need to get through this content in this amount of time. And so I'm really like, I'm thinking about in terms of the, the next session, little plug for keeping learners motivated and making people feel successful so then they wanna learn the next skill and not be overwhelmed. So I, I'm wondering if anyone else is thinking about that as well or what, your thoughts are if your learners you think would prefer to learn things well, or if they come in with an expectation that they'll learn some, you know, all of these things by the end, or if you think that that might be something to try and see if that um, leads to different outcomes in your classes. Like I'm, I'm just, it's such a simple thing, but really like can change how you deliver this content. What does anyone else think? I mean, I think it is uh, more accessible um, when you actually slow it down and give them, give them a chance to learn it well. Um, because uh, what it does is that I think it perhaps eases uh, the frustration of perhaps not comprehending something. And I think what it does is it encourages uh, those patrons to come back. Um, you know, and maybe come back for a more advanced class or just come back for perhaps a review if you're doing the class again and there's something that they really want to make sure that they nail down. Yeah, I know um, our digital navigators were at one point working with people who were in their 80s. And the, the feedback they got was, um, Thank you for being so patient, for letting me learn it at my own pace. Uh, it was, you know, and then, and then the people offered to make cookies for them. <laughs> so they were very appreciative. This was during COVID, so that it was all over the, you know, over Zoom. Um, uh, I think that if someone is is coming in to maybe get a certificate, that is one thing where they'll maybe be like, I need to know all this information to pass the assessment. But if you're working with people who are wanting to learn digital literacy in, you know, in general, going at their speed is probably always, it, it will make that connection with you. They'll make them trust you, make them feel like they are heard. And of course, you know, you don't want to keep repeating something that they're obviously getting uh, if, if they're ready to move on. Um, much harder in a classroom situation, of course, because you're going to have a variety of different skills. So in those situations, what's nice about this is if um, it's an English language learning class or people are learning English, there's the skill, the digital skill, but also the English vocabulary. So you're kind of could be hitting, you know, both. And I also um, will show you something at the end where um, you can have students who are getting it kind of teach students who maybe are not yet. And so they're then learning more because they're teaching um, and helping you. And then the other people are getting another another chance at it. 
So that can be another way if you have multiple people in the classroom versus one-on-one. -on -one. I was also thinking that um, this is the only chance they have to practice with some devices because if they don't have a desktop at home or a laptop at home, you know, the only time they have to actually practice or use this stuff. So if you go over it, you know, a lot of times, um, mm -hmm. yeah, like they just don't have the opportunity to go home and, oh, let me turn on my laptop and see what we learned in class today, you know? Right. That is true. And I found too that, you know, when I'm teaching a class, let's say with a, a variety of different, you know, people pick up things quicker, maybe they come in with more skills, is to for those people who want to explore you know let's say they they know how to turn on the computer they've gotten how to turn on the computer down and they want to explore using the mouse i, I let them you know i i mean using computers and devices a lot of it is about creativity and about exploration and about innovation and so um if if they don't need, if they've learned the skill and the rest of the class hasn't yet, if they want to go on and say, hey, what does this do? What does this do? You know, they're not going to, most likely the advices you're giving them, they're not going to break anything on there. So um, that is another way of learning um, that, that many people, especially on computers, find helpful and fun and fun. So, but that's a really good, you know, point that you make, Andrea. It is a mind shift. All right. So here again, we're looking at terminology. I'm gonna I want to skip to kind of different examples. So here, the next the next um, routine is about logging into a device, logging out, and restarting. So first, you know, that first routine was more about terminology. So if you are wanting people to learn vocabulary, if you want to ex expand on that, that first routine is good. Here, you know, again, you would probably put a picture of whatever device you have and the login, you know, that you have to log in. Um, but it's also good to, to let people know that depending on, again, their language level, Sometimes you have to log in and sometimes you don't. Um, any other thoughts about, you know, logging in slides? Um, it might be a good time to just kind of do a, a knowledge check to make sure, hey, what is logging in? Like, what's the context for it? Right, right. And why, why do some programs make you log in? Like, what's the advantage to having to log in? Or what does it protect you from? Right? So that might be something to talk about. You know, this keeps, keeps whatever information there private and secure, hopefully. Um, and, and if you don't have to log in, it's probably, you know, just to know that whatever you're doing in there is not secure. All right. So move my zoom control so I can read this. Um, so here we're, we're looking at, uh, we're getting more into like actually using the computer and how do you navigate the computer? So you can see it says, where do you click to log out of this account? Now, if you just ask this question, I might just ask this question, can you guess? And probably most people couldn't unless they had encountered this before. Um, and so I'm curious to hear what you think, um, how, how you would help someone, how do I wanna say this? So, you know, in this case, you're gonna click on the, the person, right? To, to log out. How do you make that connection? That that's, 
where you might look. Because if you, you're used to computers, you might know, oh, that's where I might look, or here's some other places I might look. But how do you initially make that connection? Any thoughts? To be honest, I probably would have clicked on the settings, that gear icon first. Okay. So I think for me, it would probably be trial and error. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really good thing to say. Um, I think that we as educators want to be clear that everybody, it, like digital literacy is lifelong learning. We're all learning and we don't always know the answers. Like I certainly don't know all the answers. Um, and sometimes it's helpful to do it together as you know, even as a class to say, well, where do, where do you think we should click? I, I don't know, even if you do, I don't know. Let's, and someone said the gear and, and I honestly think it's the person, but I could be wrong here in this case. So let's try that. Let's click on that and see if there, if we see anything that looks like logging out. Um, and you might say, I think, uh, the gear, you know, the gear usually is about settings and maybe that would have something in there about logging in, being logged in or logged out. Um, you know, it might even be the little waffle thing next to the person there too. So giving that the idea, I think that um, even though we want to think of computers as there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it, there's usually multiple ways to do things. Some Sometimes there are multiple ways to do things. And sometimes it is trial and error. Like, well, I know I should be able to do this. How do I do it? So the more important part is I should be able to do this. How can I figure out how to do it? So we should be able to log out of an account if we've put in a, a username and password. How does that happen? Any other any other ways you might once let's say you did trial and error once you found that it was under the person to make that connection like how you might explain okay well here we found it why do you think it's there or how can I help you remember this. So why would the person icon maybe let me log out? You can take a yes. Maybe because it's your personal account, like it's related to you as a person. Yeah, that's what I would say. I'd say, okay, well, here we found that it's under the, you know, this symbol of a person. So I'm going to think about it. The way I'm going to remember it is um, that person is me. And when I want it to not be me, I'm going to log out. Now that's how I'm going to remember it. But, and you can then ask the class, how will you remember it? And so, you know, those kind of, because, you know, as you know, when you're encountering a new, a new screen, there's a lot of stuff on the screen. I mean, if you're looking at it, there's tons, especially if you're new to digital literacy, there's tons of symbols on here. There's all these, you know, emails, um, all these words, there's a lot going on. So trying to give people ways that they, that will help them remember how to do these things, you know, their own ways um, can be helpful. Okay. Girl, I was just thinking of, you know, maybe another way to help people remember it. Or, okay. And, you know, it might stick for some people, might not, but um, think of it as, um, you know, you're at, uh, when I look at the person in the circle, you think of somebody at the door. So, you know, you can, you can get in and out of the door by 
you can get in and out of the door. Um, yeah, that's a great that's a great description and an example like of how someone might like think of it. And I think that um, it can also be kind of fun when you you know you're getting people to to be creative about well how do you what do you think the symbol uh, how how do you, how will you remember that this symbol means to log out. Um, which can lighten the tension or, you know, decrease anxiety if people are kind of like, okay, yeah, I can remember that. So that's a, that's another great explanation. Thanks for sharing that. All right. So let's look at, I'm trying, trying, trying to advance my screen. Oh, here. So I did advance my screen. Maybe you didn't see that. So here was the question. And then the next screen shows they they've circled it in yellow of um more long of that account and then the next screen i think i missed oh it says where do you click to log out of this account wait wasn't that what it said before ah so then you clicked on the person and then this is the next the pop up that comes up. Sorry, I was a little forgetting about that. So then you might say, let's click on the person. Okay, now here, where do you think I would click to log out? And now maybe, maybe it's more apparent, but maybe not if people don't know what sign out means is the same as log out, right? So that's another you know way you can say sign out, log out mean the same thing typically. Okay. So here we see examples of restart. And again, you're talking about, well, what does restart mean? Or what does it do? Um, any thoughts about how you might explain that? Like we all know what it does. But how do you explain it? Sometimes you have to think about, you know, and maybe as a class, you'd say, well, let's try this. Let's take a computer and click on restart. What happens? So right, it turns off the it turns off the computer, but then starts it again. So re, you know, if you're teaching English, re usually means that it's going to happen again. And so then you could even go down the path of here are other words that start with re, return, re, you know, re, send or whatever. Um. So sometimes, so I'm if if you're able. I'm a big fan of, you know, showing what you what you're teaching in digital literacy. Showing what you're teaching. If people can practice it on their own, that's even better. Um, you know, we're limited by by funding for devices and everything, but um, that can be helpful. All right. So then um, at, you know, after the lessons, there's always this check. So can you log into your device? Can you restart your device? And having people practice this. So maybe you, you know, have someone make sure they can log in, they can restart it, point out the various parts that are on their device, um, maybe somehow label them, and then turn it off. And well, and on. So then each each um, topic has what we call a rubric. And this is something where after you've gone through this material, again, if you have multiple people, well, you could even do this with one person, um, but you can give them this rubric and you would have to explain it to say, okay, so here the on the top, this is something that you can do and you could show someone how to do else how to do this. Or this is something you could do, but maybe you couldn't show someone else. 
or no, I need more practice. So this can be a quick way for you to see, you know, how the class is feeling. And then here's asking, you know, the different things. I can turn on and off my device. Um, I can use a mouse or a touchpad to click on the place that I want. And you can read these. Um, the other thing that you can do with this is you can make it into a kind of a classroom game. So people can have this and then they have to find, they, they answer it, but then they have to find someone who can show them the skill. Or if they, you know, if they're the person who can show this skill, you have to find someone who needs more practice. And so you're kind of getting people up and mingling and, and practicing not only their digital skills, but also their language skills, um, communication skills. So that can be a kind of a fun way to, to get people out of their seats. Uh, and then this is just explaining what I just explained. And it's called a mingle, is the name of it. Um, so when you are when you are teaching digital literacy, it's always great to you know learn new things. So let's say you get beyond the the slides. Well, you can go to North Star always. Um, but you know, build on skills that have been already taught. So you've learned one thing, okay, you've learned how to turn on and off a computer. Well, then people might be saying, well, what can I do with the computer? So then looking at the next, maybe is learning how to get onto the internet. Repetition is always great. Um, you might want to, something you you know taught the last week, you might want to just say, how do we turn on a computer again? Let's just refresh really quickly. Um, we talked about the speed and promoting exploration. Trial and error is really, is really good in computers unless you're trying a whole bunch of things, you finally figure out how to do it and then you've forgotten what <laughs> how you did it. And you know, like I have done this many a time. I'm like, okay, I know I did this, how did I do it? So that piece about um, that we were talking about with the little person, that um, memory device, like how will I remember that this is how I did something? If I'm trying doing trial and error, that can be really helpful too, kind of that mnemonic or, or like in North Star, when I'm telling people about you're going to do proctoring, proctoring is for assessments, so you're going to look under the assessment tab. Just kind of a way to kind of remember where to look. Um, any thoughts that you have at this point, or anything that you can teach me? All right, so let's look at the actual routines. Um, they they have been reviewed pretty much. Um, we just have to add that, um, the team has to add the using email one, and that should be done by the by March. But you, I will give you all the link to this, or maybe I won't. Uh, all right, I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to get it here for you and then share it. While you do that, I'm going to put a link into the chat for um, the evaluation form for this session. Um, this is to assist with our IMLS reporting. And of course, your feedback is valuable for planning future sessions and um, making sure that we have um, the State Library offers things that would be beneficial. Also in the chat, I'll put in the link to register for the um, the next session that Teresa is teaching, and that is keeping learners motivated. So I think that's a really good segue from this into that. Um, and if you have any questions or anything, I'll also put my email in the chat so that you can reach out to me. There we go. Just to go back to what you guys were talking about in the beginning, I uh, noticed in in I had a I had a patron who was complaining because of digital coupons at at Shoprite, yeah. so they had to be 
in order to get the sale price, they needed to have downloaded the digital coupon. So I uh -huh. noticed, yeah. So we were talking about things that you can't do if you if you don't. So then I noticed that in Shoprite they have a tablet set up near customer service for people to download digital coupons because I'm sure they were getting a little tired of people coming to customer service complaining about how you know they were right. they were charged they weren't charged the price that was on the thing. So. Um, right. I was just That's thinking, I said, the personnel at ShopRite is probably teaching people how to use the tablet. Right. So, okay. So that is probably true. And that's a good um, potential partnership, right? For the library to say, hey, we know that this is probably happening. Um, if you want to send people to the library to learn these skills, we'd be happy to teach them because you at ShopRite probably don't have the staffing capacity to do this or, or the you know background. Um, so that could be a good community partnership. All right, so I put the link in the chat to these. Um, again, you are feel free to download them um, and then you can, once you've downloaded them, you can make whatever changes you want. Um, but you can see that it does um, kind of, to walk you through the guide and um, how to use them. So if you want to share this with anyone you want to, feel free. Um, but it kind of goes through exactly, you know, if you want a lot of detail about how to use them, it is here. Um, it would talk, it talks about how it links. So what we are looking at are the digital skill building routines, the second column. Um, it's looking at what skills are supported in here. So uh, the North Star Digital Literacy Basic Computer Skills Standards. And then um, the CCRS and TIF, these are, well, CCRS, if you're teaching um, adult literacy, this is a nationwide standard. Um, if you don't, if you don't use these standards, then it doesn't matter to you. And TIF is the Minnesota standards for soft skills or business skill, business workplace skills. And so it's just showing you kind of what workplace skills this is also teaching. Then the third column, the English Unlock curriculum, that again is something that Literacy in Minnesota has created for teaching uh, English language learning. You do not have to, you don't have to have it to use these routines. It's just, you know, for organizations that do, it shows you how they link to that curriculum. And then um, with the last column is the North Star curriculum. So it's showing you kind of what lessons they link to in the North Star curriculum, if you want to expand on, on those routines. Um, and then it continues on. Here's a planning guide just to start you thinking about, well, what, Digital, you know, as you said, where should we start? What makes the most sense? Um, are you going to pre-assess? How will you pre-assess? What routines do you think would fit into what you're already teaching or that fit the needs and desires of the learners? Um, are you going to change any of the slides? Um, so how to do that, make a copy and then change it. And then how to incorporate the routine and how to support the learners. And then our symbol of restarting. <laughs> All right. And so then as you should, I'm trying to see where the routines are. Oh, I know where they are. Um, so then in the green column, these are where all the routines are located. So if we look at, let's look at finding information online. Just my zoom controls here. So you can see that it would make you make a copy. So you're not changing the original. And then here is the copy so I can change them as I wish. So this is, you know, looking at a little bit harder skills, a little more difficult skills. Um, and well, we kind of went through that. 
but here it says, you know, looking at how does it connect to an internet uh, to the internet. Um, so again, I wanna I want to show you. Okay, so here's one where you're actually practicing this skill, and um, it takes you kind of step by step. Now, you know depending on, as you look at this, thinking about the people you're working with, how might you need to um, expand upon this or, you know, assuming that you'd gotten to the part where they knew how to turn on a computer and they knew how to, um, they were connected to the Wi-Fi or whatever, to the internet. You know, one of the things I look at is like, first they'd have to find where Google is, right? The Google search engine or whatever search ending you might not be using Google. So that'd be one thing you'd have to teach. And then the slide above, they kind of do look at, you know, what the address bar is, where the search bar is. What else do you um, think you might wanna teach or change? So I was, go ahead, Andrea. I was going to say I would change the time in New York City because that's our time zone. So oh, yeah, <laughs> change it to maybe time in San Diego mm -hmm. or maybe even somewhere else in the world, right? That people might not know. Um, I was working with a group in Ghana and they were saying, I, I one of the searches was looking for like pictures of kittens and they were these were people who were going to be teaching teachers how to use digital literacy. And they said, could we change this? So it's something more pertinent to like what teachers would look up. I'm like, sure, that would be, you know, much more valuable because that is kittens was pretty generic and safe, I think, but, you know, finding what they want to look, what they actually would be looking up would be more interesting to the group. All right. So then this is, again, practicing that same skill. So you can see that it's looking at um, doing the same thing, that repetition, but now we're in Chicago. And, um, you know, you could do this multiple times. Um, but then it's looking at what search terms could you use for something? And of course, there's multiple ways to search for something. So if you have a little bit, um, someone who's a little more advanced or has has learned this, you can say, okay, well, how could we look for the time, you know, who the president of Mexico is or something and try typing different things that you come up with and see, do you get the same results? Um, could you put in just president Mexico? Would you want to put in who is the president of Mexico? If, could you put in Mexican president, you know, like, how how are the results the same or different when you use those different search terms um, would be a great way for people to explore thinking about how they go about searching because as you know as librarians it's uh you know definitely there's an art to searching um any other thoughts you have about kind of teaching people this Right. Um, so here now they're saying, here's the question, here are the relevant search terms. Um, however, if someone wanted to type in the sentence, it would still get them right the same results. So I think it's important to let people know that what they prefer, if they want to type in fewer words, they can, but if they want to think of it as how would I post this question, nowadays, you know, that would get them the answer too. And oftentimes I will, that's how I'll search. I'll be like, okay, this is the question I'd ask somebody. So I'm asking the, the internet universe. 
Okay. Um, but I think this is getting at if you are if you are not good at typing, if you aren't good at maybe writing full sentences, there are you can still search on this information. And then again, it's reiterating, you know, these where the address bar and the search bar are. So here's again more practice. So again, practicing, practicing, practicing. And when you feel that people are are understanding it and they feel they're understanding it, you can always move ahead. Or you can always, one fun thing to do is to have the, the class come up with the questions themselves, you know, or the topic, what question do we want to answer? Um, especially if you're working with people from other countries, they often like to show things about their country to the class, you know? So what is the time in Mogadishu, for example, or what, do, what is the weather? What is the capital? A lot of times, you know, there's obviously pride from where they came from. And so being able to not only, and it helps them see the value in this in terms of they can share with others um, this information or pictures from their country or something that they know, like a food that they know, that can be a great way of communication, you know, starting a conversation. All right, so um, go back to my slides here. So those are the routines. Um, feel free to use them as you wish. Oh, I wanted to share one thing with you and it's not in this presentation, but I will just quickly open another presentation. Um, I did wanna share with you, there is a resource that um, I've probably shared on some of these before but that was created by um, Digital, Prom Digital Promise and um, Barbara Bush Foundation. And it's about how to work with adults on digital literacy, just kind of from a, a lot of it is um, like theory, but um, there's also some practical things that Northstar contributed as well. And so I find it to be, a, if you want a kind of a comprehensive guide, it's pretty good. I have to, um... so here it is. I'll put this in the chat. And it's kind of lengthy, I will say. Um, like I mentioned, there's a lot of theory in here, but if you are looking just for kind of strategies, chapter five on page 33 has the strategies for working with an adult learner. Um, but it can it goes through a lot of, you know, like I said, Literacy Minnesota and the field of adult foundational skills, adult basic education has been working with adults on literacy for a long time. So it can kind of um, just talk to you about how to work with adults in general on digital literacy. So with that, um, any final comments or questions you all have? And if not, it was great to um, spend time with all of you and hopefully it was it's always fun for me to hear your thoughts as well um, hopefully this got you thinking about some ways you can work with your students work with students um, and as Andrea said I will be back um, you'll have to remind me of the date 